Welcome everyone and thank you for joining our scientific session on extreme heat and a changing climate. My name is Bree Lindsay and I am the Director of Science Services at the California Council on Science and Technology. I'd like to open our session today by acknowledging that I'm moderating from Sacramento, California, the tribal land of the Nishinan people and a gathering place for many, a gathering place for many local tribes. To Southern Maidu people to the north, the Valley and Plains Miwok people to the south of the American River and the Patuan Winton of the Sacramento River. Today, I'll introduce CCST, our Disaster Resilience Initiative, and the topic of our discussion. The California Council on Science and Technology is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization established over 30 years, just over 30 years legislature. Um, CCST was created to provide science and technology advice from the wealth of outstanding academic and research institutions in our state to help strengthen policy. Our job at CCST is to help amplify and translate the expertise that this network has to offer into actionable policy advice. We do, we do this through a number of including briefings, workshops, peer-reviewed reports, and also our CCST Science Fellows Program where we place PhD scientists and engineers for a year of government service and leadership training in California state executive and legislative offices. As part of our mission, CCST is advancing our disaster resilience initiative to help California, California better prepare for and restoring complex and intersecting disasters that affect public health, our economy, and our environment. These include climate change, extreme heat, power outages, and the COVID-19 pandemic, which are all radically disrupting the ways in which we live and work. These often painful disruptions can also give us opportunities to redesign our systems to be more resilient and resilient and sustainable. So CST's Disaster Resilience Initiative, we seek to deliver science and technology advice to reduce harm and improve lives. And today's focus will be on ways in which we can improve community resilience to extreme heat in a changing climate. Even small changes in average temperature can have dramatic impacts on human health and the economy. Despite our climate change policy, climate change policies, our world is all warm as a consequence of climate change. And driven by the urban heat island effect, dense urban, urban cores are especially susceptible to the warming effects of climate change. Disadvantaged communities are not only warmer, but have less access to the technologies like AC that can give them relief. Today I have with me three experts working to understand how extreme heat impacts, extreme heat impacts communities and ways to access intensifying climate-related disaster. I'd like to start by asking Dr. Michael Weiner to introduce himself and his research. Thank you, Bree, and thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Michael Weiner. I'm a senior scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California. My research interests are the detection, attribution, and projection of extreme weather in a climate change in as the climate changes. By detection, I mean um, looking at the observ observational record and, uh, in a very statistically rigorous way, uh, finding those uh, variables of, of interest that are changing um, in today's discussion that would be uh, uh, extreme heat waves. Attribution is the uh, the art and science of trying to understand what causes those changes. And uh, of course, for uh, we all know that that uh, human consumption of fossil fuels, uh, uh, coal, gas, and oil have uh, have caused the planet to warm, and that of course is reflected in in changes in heat waves. And then by projection, I mean um, trying to understand what might happen in the future, uh, given some assumptions about our uh, behavior in the use of, of fossil fuels, ranging from very serious mitigation policies that would uh, uh, reduce our carbon dioxide uh, production to, uh, to uh, what I call no policy scenarios or business as usual, where we keep on going in the direction that we are. So thank you, Bree. Thank you so much, Michael. I'll pass it over to Dr. Glenn Hulley to introduce himself and his research. I think you're muted. Sorry. Sorry, there we go. Not the first, I guess. Um, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Glenn Hulley. I'm a research scientist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. 
in uh, California. And my, my expertise is to use satellite thermal infrared data to try and study land surface properties, and in particular, the land surface temperature of the Earth's surface. Um, these land surface temperatures are used to quantify both urban heat islands, detect droughts, help with irrigation decision making, and a lot and a pretty wide range of, of earth surface studies. And for this, we use thermal sensors both from from space. Um, some examples include EcoStress, Landsat, uh, Modis, um, and then also airborne data. And I'm currently leading the production of, of the standard production of these, these products for, for NASA Earth Science and Research Activities. Um, more recently, I've been looking at the, using this data, looking at the effects of urban climate science and how extreme um, temperatures are affecting urban areas in Southern California. Um, an important aspect of this has also been modeling the societal vulnerability of extreme heat within the city of LA in particular. And I'm currently working with the LA City and Streets LA at the moment in a two-year project to try and help and quantify the effects of, of cool mitigation strategies that, are, that have been implementing across the city. Um, these include um, painting the roads with cooler paint surfaces and also just planting more trees and specifically in the more undeserved communities in Los Angeles. Thank you. Um, and next, I will ask Dr. Simanjit Kaur to introduce herself and her research. Uh, thanks, Bri. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this session. Uh, I'm Sumanjit Kaur. I'm a research scientist and group lead of Thermal Energy Group here at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in California. In our group, we do a variety of research all the way uh, from wastewater treatment to low and high thermal energy storage materials and the you know designing of new material using machine learning in context of today's discussion i will discuss the research in our group uh, where we look at solid state cooling materials and devices made using those materials so you know this caloric effect has been known for a long time that you can produce this temperature change in a material by applying like external feed like electric magnetic uh, mechanical but to use that mechanical property and make a device out of it so that it can provide high efficient cooling and uh, at a cost competitive price, that is where uh, my research is focused on. I'll also talk about the other solutions for which my group doesn't work on, but in general, which are available. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you all for joining today. It's really wonderful to get to hear from everybody. I think I'll start today's discussion by just asking the panel a, a context setting question, just general, how have extreme heat events changed with the changing climate and what are the projections into the future? Michael, would you like to start? Uh, yes, I would. Um, heat waves are one of those um, uh, kind of extreme weather where we seem rather obvious that as a planet warms, that would get worse. And indeed it does. Um, we um, we we are able to with with our current methodologies be actually able to make statements about uh, the human influence on individual heat waves, um, and and or as well as more general and more generally, I would say that that pretty much every heat wave that happens anywhere on the planet today has been made warmer by climate change. Um, over the United States, about three to five degrees uh, Fahrenheit warmer. Um, which doesn't maybe sound like a lot, but indeed it is. Um, the impacts of a 105 degree heat wave are a lot less on human health than 110 degrees. And so, um, uh, so every little bit matters. Um, the, uh, uh, some, some of the heat waves that we've, we've recently experienced have been so off the charts that they pretty much couldn't have reached those temperatures without uh, the, the, this human interference in the climate system. Um, the one in the recent one in the Pacific Northwest with temperatures of 115 in Washington state and even 120 degrees in, in, uh, in uh, British Columbia, Canada, um, were, they're still extremely unlikely to happen today, but they were virtually impossible to happen um, in our grandparents' time. As we go into the future, you know, it's it's really up to us. Um, the 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 Paris Agreement um, set targets of 
of global warming levels of 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees, which you may be familiar with. To put that in context, we're about at 1.1 degree above the pre-industrial temperatures now. Uh, 1.5 degrees would probably happen uh, within the next decade or two. And 2 degrees probably, you know, shortly thereafter if we don't uh, radically reduce our emissions. By the end of the century, if we don't reduce our emissions, um, there's, you know, there's a lot of possibilities of where we'd end up at, but it could be as much as, as three or four degrees warmer than the pre-industrial or, or that's centigrade. So three, um, uh, you know, almost three degrees warmer centigrade now, which means that heat waves would be um, substantially worse, you know, um, putting it in Fahrenheit again, sorry, for switching, um, uh, you know, probably you know, 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit warmer at the end of the century than now. That will make parts of the world uninhabitable. Um, you know, humans won't be able, at least outside. Um, and uh, um, that's, I think, something we're going to discuss later about who the most vulnerable people are. There's not a lot of good news here, I'm afraid, from me. <laughs> So you, you've segued directly into um, my next question, which is, you know, how does extreme heat impact different communities and who is really at risk of suffering most from the effects, from the effects of extreme heat? I think I'll ask Glenn to start this. Um, so in, in terms of the, the effects of you know, of, of, of health issues, morbidity, mortality during these extreme heat events that, that we experience. Um, it's usually um, the elderly, you know, younger children and, and people with pre-existing conditions that are more susceptible um, to those increases in, in heat. Um, uh, in terms of environmental justice concerns, recent studies have actually found that um, uh, looking at all the cities in the US, almost 72% of those cities um, had higher heat and a larger exposure to heat um, in the low income neighborhoods and with people of color as well. Um, and this, you know, this is an incidental consequence of, of the location of these areas within the city. They're near the city center with larger uh, proportions of man made surfaces and lower vegetation density. And what we found specifically in LA is that. Um, during extreme heat events, um, these types of areas experience up to five degrees more warming um, than, than other communities of, with higher income near, nearer the coast, larger vegetation density. Um, and at night, that, that falls down to about a two degree of, of, of more warming. But that, that is still pretty significant. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these findings, they really suggest that policymakers, decision makers in these cities, they should really strongly consider redesigning the city in terms of um, implementing uh, more heat reduction strategies. Um, these, for example, are uh, smart surfaces, which uh, Sumanjit will talk about um, uh, next. Um, but then also just planting more trees. You know, trees are, are nature's air, condition, air conditioners, if you will. Um, they cool the air through transpiration, and then they also provide shading. So, so a combination of, of changing the surfaces to more cooler reflective surfaces, and then also just planting more trees in, in these neighborhoods should should help mitigate the, the effects of, of heat exposure and heat stress. Could I, could I add some other communities at risk? Um, uh, besides the cities, which of course, you know, are important, um, important uh, uh, area of concern. Also people in rural areas um, and people who work outdoors are are very much at risk. Uh, some of that work can be shifted tonight, um, some can't. Um, in California, the people most at, at risk uh, right now are agricultural workers, many of whom are undocumented and um, are reluctant to, um, to, uh, um, to challenge their employers when they might be forced to work out in conditions that are unhealthy. Um, and so, uh, there, there are compounding factors um, in uh, in the in the California county, the ag big agricultural counties in in the Central Valley, like uh, Fresno County and Kern County. There, 
there's a uh, an affliction that 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 many of these these uh, workers suffer called that they call valley fever, when um when it's it's dry and the winds are blowing, uh, alkali dust from some of the dry lake beds blows up and they inhale that and that um, can damage their lungs. Then later on, when there's a heat wave, these people are already have a pre-existing condition and are, are vulnerable. And so, um, so we have concerns both in the urban areas and in the rural areas. Uh, this is this is um, th this, is, but it is not an equal opportunity hazard, in that the, uh, the 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 people in the in the in the lowest income brackets are usually the ones most at risk. It sounds like uh, different communities are being impacted differently, and I think we'll get more into that soon. And I'd love to hear first from Simanjit. Um, Glenn referred to some of these technologies that are emerging that might help us mitigate extreme heat. Um, can you tell us some of that? Yeah, sure. Um, I think there are some which can be in the market today, and there are some emerging which will take a little bit more time to come to the market. So what Glenn was referring to the smart surfaces, so in under that category, you can put cool roofs, cool pavement, right? So there are, I mean, the national labs have done a lot of work, both Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and Oak Ridge National Lab in this area uh, where they have developed these materials, which will, instead of absorbing uh, heat, they are reflecting heat. And not only that, they have emittance in the right window so that whatever heat is absorbed is also emitted out. Now, what this translates into is that your house is not getting that hot on a hotter day. So your AC load, the electricity consumption is low. So you are really helping this cycle because remember, we are in this place today because of the climate change. And we do not want to have solutions which put more CO2 in the climate. So I would also like to point out that, yes, we can paint the house cool and have cool pavement. But we have to also keep in mind people are not going to throw away the ACs. They are still going to run the AC units. So it is important to make those existing air conditioner unit more energy efficient. You know, for example, you know, if you look at these developing countries like India, I mean, the middle class is growing. They can now afford more air conditioner unit. It's hot and humid air. To cool down hot and humid air is very difficult. So there are technologies now which are coming up where we say that let's make the hot, humid air dry first and then cool it down. That way you can make an air conditioning unit more 70% more efficient. So these kind of approaches, it has to be a multi-pronged approach that you make your air conditioning unit more energy efficient so that you know more, since more people are affording this air AC unit. They are not putting so much CO2 back in that uh, atmosphere. We should work on the low GWP refrigerant, uh, then this kind of solution of cool roofs. And then also would like to, in terms of emerging, uh, maybe in next five or six, 10 years uh, time span, is this solid state cooling, uh, which I talked about. So what it is, is that we are going beyond vapor compression. I mean, we have been stuck with this vapor compression, AC conditioning for more than 50, 100 years, because this is the best we, the way we can uh, you know, cool the spaces. But what about we can come up with the solid state cooling where we are not using vapor compression, where we are using the material properties. As I mentioned, material can be, have a temperature change depending on whether I apply electric field, magnetic field, or you know mechanical field. But can we tap into that? Can we just make a device out of it such that it is not only cost competitive with the existing technologies, but can provide high performance? So yes, I think in space of solution, there's there's a lot of research ongoing on this field of solid state cooling, but the immediate solutions are also available in terms of, you know, cool roofs and making the existing AC unit more energy efficient. I think one, imp one important part of that is um, for cities to expand on, on policies to subsidize more um, uh, solar panels to, to the, these poorer communities. Um, you know, the, the solar panels will provide more sustainable energy so they can run the AC, uh, ACs if they have them for much longer. Um, and uh, another additional benefit is that solar panels are more reflective than traditional uh, roofs. And so you have more reflectivity on the roof and, and, and cooling of, of, the, of the home itself. So I think there's a double, double benefit there for that. And I know in LA, they, they did introduce this program a couple of years ago. I'm not sure if they've sustained it 
but uh, I think that that's definitely a, a large, important part of, of, of heat mitigation. So if I can add on to that, so uh, that's a very good point. I totally agree with that because it cannot be just technologies solving all the problem. It has to be hand in hand with the policymaker, the incentives uh, to provide these kind of you know facilities for uh, um, the low income communities um, and the areas which are hit hard. Also, there is something. Uh, you know, most of these people live in a rented space. So, you know, if a landlord is incentivized to that, you know, you will get this benefit if you take your properties and paint them with these things, right? Cool roof, for example. Yeah. It is available as a pa paint also. You don't have to go and put new shingles. You can just have a, you know, paint. So I think these kind of approaches are a quick fix and can provide quick solutions, right? Till we come up with more, uh, you know, the next generation cooling devices. I have a question that that goes in asks to go a little bit more in depth into this and what are these or what other medic mitigation measures are actionable at the community or local level um, not necessarily relying on policymakers um, at the state and federal um, level to be able to act really quickly to respond to needs that question comes from Aaron Regan I mean, you, you, just one example I can think of is you can go into your local Home Depot and actually buy this cool paint. You know, I forget what what the brand is, but um, you can uh, you can get it in either gray or white color, I think. And you know, you can just go home and, and directly paint your roof. And one of my friends actually did that, this in Los Angeles, and um, it was kind of an interesting experiment. I took one of our thermal cameras from lab to go and measure the before and after temperatures from before when he painted it. He, before, I think he had black shingles before, and then he just painted it with this white reflective color. And you won't believe, like during a heat wave day, it was about 35 degrees cooler with no, the I believe white you. paint. No, I and, totally believe you, because this no. is on the US DOE's website. Sorry to interrupt. They they have done this experiment, and there is this yeah. exactly. Your data matches. So second okay. validation. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is the, the surface of the, the actual surface temperature. It's not the ambient air, but it, there will be a strong correlation there um, with that cooling effect. And, you know, he did report that he actually, um, I think he was on a blog about this in LA at one point. He did report that he, he didn't need to use his air conditioner as much, you know, during the summer months because of just, just painting his roof. So, yeah. I would like to add education, right? People don't even know if you are not aware that such kind of thing, for example, exists. And you know, and people are also worried about aesthetic when it comes down to their house. So I just want to say it is not only just white. You can get these shingles in a light colored in all those things, and uh, and it's available in the you know different uh, uh, by different manufacturers. So I think education is a very important part of this puzzle that to educate people. Uh, that these are the solution, cheap solution, which are out there. Could I add that there are <clears throat> um, some very, very concrete things that local communities can do that are um, social. One of the things that um, I believe the city of Philadelphia did was um, uh, set up a system to go and check at the people who are vulnerable. Now, most of the people, many of the people who are vulnerable are elderly. And so, having somebody just call them up and say, you know, are you okay? Simple as that is, it can, can actually help a lot because if they're not okay, then you, then you send help. And, and so, um, so, you know, it, it, cities can be a big, scary place, you know, and you don't always know your neighbors. Um, I live in a city. I don't know that many neighbors. Um, but I think, you know, returning to basically, you know, sort of a village mentality, where we do are connected to each other, and and we know who the vulnerable people are, and 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 you know take action when there's a hazard like this. And so, you know that that's something a neighborhood society could do, you know, and and, and doesn't require you know some kind of federal mandate. I mean that that's that's clearly something that that you know I think is appealing on many levels. Um, we have a question, too, from Stefan Peterson, I think, uh, kind of 
going back to what you were saying earlier, Samanjit, about the the solution the the solutions have to be cognizant of the problem that caused that how we got here. And so the question is, how carbon intensive is it to produce some of these materials required for local level or larger scale um, mitigation actions? As it's a very good question, a very important question. So there are, as I said, many solutions out there. Uh, and I think this is, people are keeping this in mind, mind that you should not put more carbon into the atmosphere while you are making this solution out there. So like, for example, this paint, this, um, the cool roof solutions, I don't, these are all ceramic pigments which are integrated. Uh, uh, so I don't think they have too much of a carbon footprint. But you know, I also would like to highlight there are solutions which have very minimal uh, carbon footprint and could provide passive cooling. For example, this this you know a company which came out of Stanford, which produced these panels, which can not only reflect it goes beyond cool roof. It not only reflect the light, but it also emit whatever energy is absorbed. It emits in a in a wavelength eight to thirteen micron, where our atmosphere is transparent. So it does not absorb that so it see it goes to outer space which is at three kelvin so no matter what is your temperature here you always have a heat sink right there and these are the panels which are made with ceramic coatings right so uh, these are very low carbon footprint material and they are providing passive cooling no electricity needed you just put it on your roof and day and night 24 7 you will have lower temperature than ambient because it is continuously radiating to the outer sink spaces. So there are, in terms of solutions, I think there is a lot of solution out there uh, with low carbon footprint, more energy efficient, and they can not, they can be used as add-on, like you don't have to replace your AC and have this. I mean, they have showed this company, SkyCool, uh, they have shown that you can integrate these panels with the existing AC unit and bring down the energy consumption by 30%. Right. So I think there are a lot of these kind of solution available which can be add on to the existing infrastructure and bring down the energy cost and make it more efficient. Um, I hope that I answered the question. I'd like to put it in perspective, though. Um, you know, it's great that, that these things can be made with low carbon footprint, but the reality is, is that, you know, the major sources of carbon dioxide now are, are transportation. Um, and energy production, and um, and if we're really going to mitigate the um, you know our emissions, we have to address those those um, um, sources um, and and stop burning coal, gas, and oil. I mean, it's as simple as that. And and get our energy from other sources. And and so while it's great to reduce you know every place you can, um, in order to make a real difference, we have to have um, substantial changes to our our uh, our energy economy, which are sort of outside of the the the, um, the the bounds of this this discussion today. No, but it's a very valid point. I mean, it's hundred percent. I mean, there is no other way we can reduce the carbon fruit if we don't go from go hundred percent renewable. But as we transition to that, we have to still plug in where the, you know all the holes so that we can uh, stop this carbon. Uh, yeah, you know, no. I, I agree. I, I'm just asked oftentimes, you know, what can I do to um, to uh, to make a difference? And and the reality is, is that, you know, the most important thing you can do is vote, um, because, you know, if I reduce my carbon emissions to zero and nobody else does, that doesn't matter. <laughs> and so it, we have to have uh, uh, levels. We have to have actions taken at the national and the international level that are very um that are very serious, actually, in terms of of how much they'll cost and the way they impact our society. And so it's it's not there's no free lunch here, I'm afraid. We have another question um, from Susanna Kelly Shankar, who has asked, "How hard is it to redesign cities that have older infrastructure so that their urban heat island effect can be reduced?" And she asked further, is the future the creation of new cities designed with smart cooling techniques, or is it should we be focusing more on revamping the existing urban zones? 
I mean, answer is both, right? I mean, I I think the you know the for the solution I talked about um, the the cool cool roof and cool pavement. I think that can be done in the existing one, right? And when we build new infrastructure, we have to make sure that our buildings, you know, the buildings have a very high carbon footprint. They consume seventy five percent of the electricity as of today uh, in US, uh, and and they have a very high and most of the load is for heating and cooling right so i think just proper uh, weatherization of the building and you know putting all this new uh, cool roofs and cool pavement i think that that can be done uh, for the existing um, infrastructure also and that's also um, has to do with policy right so for example in la the climate resolve group um, uh, helped to to, to implement this mandate and I think it was 2013 where, where any new development, any new um, or revamped uh, property developments had to have a cool roof technology implemented, some kind of cool roof, roof technology. And while a lot of people complained about it because it was more expensive, I think that that definitely helped to re reduce the future warming from ex uh, urban expansion. Um, but, you know, for example, inner LA is pretty um, it's pretty sad. I don't think there's going to be many changes in terms of the infrastructure within the, within the city. So, um, you know, smart green roofs, green walls, things like that, probably probably the most optimal way to to cool. Speaking of these cool roof technologies, um, we have from Leanne Wilson a question about geographic access to these different uh, technologies and mitigation. So, is there a latitude limit? For choosing a cool roof, um, cooler in the summer is is good, but not necessarily in the winter. Maybe. What do you guys think of that? It's, uh, he's absolutely right. The person is absolutely right. Yes, there is a limit for that. I mean, if you have eight months of uh, you know winter, uh, then of course you you want to absorb the energy, not reflect it. Uh, so I, I don't have the number in my mind. Where is that limit? But yes. These roofs are much better for summer, and then you have to pay the energy penalty for uh, winter. But you know the what the where the research is going. I can tell you the low TRL work or the the emerging technology wise is to have more adaptive roofs. That is, they can reflect during the summer and become absorptive during the winter. And how you do that? That by having the thermal responsive material, the coating, where the if your temperature is below certain tem uh, you know temperature. Uh, below certain temperature they become um, uh, you know absorbed so that in winter you absorb all the energy and above that temperature a certain temperature it becomes reflective so yes so now that is where the research is heading is that making more adaptive material which are good both for summer and winter so right now what exists in the market uh, in the market space is more for saving from you know uh, in summer not for winter I've heard someone describe that as the transition lenses that you wear on your sunglasses, right? Where they transition from bright yes. to dark depending on the amount of sunlight coming in. Yeah. And, you know, it's just that concept applied to, to roofs pretty much. Right. So more thermoresponsive yeah. than, you know, photoresponsive kind of mm -hmm. things. Yes. Exactly. If you had asked me a year ago if it would ever be 120 degrees anywhere in Canada, I would have said, no, not without a lot more warming. Um, but here we are, last summer, you know, we had that. And so, um, um, you know, the risks of heat waves um, are not confined to lower latitudes. Um, and in fact, in some ways, you know, 120 degrees in Canada is far more dangerous than 120 degrees in Tucson. And um, because, you know, people are used to it. And so as the climate changes, and this is going to get worse. Um, yeah, I think we're going to see a demand for these kinds of solutions um, uh, um, in 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 places that you wouldn't think you would need them. You know, based on our past experience. That heat wave occurred pretty early in the year as well, right, Michael? So it was uh, June, June and July. June. Okay. Uh, yeah, so okay. it was it was you know it tends to it usually August is a little bit hotter than than those months, but um, but June and July can be hot too. Um, yeah, it was a very unusual event, and and um, our group in at Berkeley is um, 
is 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 studying it as are um, another a, a number of other groups um, the most um, visible of which is called the world weather attribution group and they did a rapid I was part of that study they did a, a rapid um, attribution uh, statement that um, the um, the climate change m made it at least a thousand times more likely but it really it was pretty much virtually impossible without climate change and that it was and their statement was two degrees centigrade or about four degrees fahrenheit uh warmer because of climate change which is consistent with other calculations i had done a couple years ago hmm. so instead of you know it still would have been hot you know instead of 120 it would have been 115 116 which is still a very very high temperature for for, for canada mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in LA, what we're finding, well, Southern California, we're finding heat waves occurring much earlier in the year. So on average, now they're starting in March, April, whereas, you know, 100 years ago, they started, you know, in June, July, August, in the middle of the summer. And, uh, you know, just a recent example, it was about two weeks ago, last week, actually, um, we had a heat wave here in LA with, you know, temperatures were in the mid 90s uh, for about four days straight. And that is, you know, very unusual. I, I don't remember that since I've been living in LA. So it's you know, and the the especially in California, but also elsewhere in the Western United States and in other parts of the world, um, uh, the, these kinds of heat increase the risk of fires. And um, yeah, so the the heat wave and fire question is not are not unrelated. Um, the health impacts are different. Um, you know, um, obviously, if you're burned out, there's a there's a, there's a health problem there, but but actually this summer millions of people were in the United States, across the country were exposed to air pollution levels that um, were you know in the dangerous categories, um, and because of these because of these fires and with the drought this year and and you know the 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 uh, the prognosis that we're probably going to have more serious heat waves again um i'm worried that uh, we'll have another summer where um people will be exposed to this toxic air you know and and and, and have you know associated cardiopulmonary problems we have some more questions i was just going to raise in there is one question about whether climate change is affecting the frequency of heat waves, or is it more that the heat waves are more extreme from Santa Gibbs? Well, it depends on how you define a heat wave. You know, if if you define a heat wave as you know a once in a lifetime event, yeah, that once in a lifetime event is warmer. But if you define a heat wave as a temperature, as a fixed temperature, yeah, that's as 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 Glenn is saying that that it's they're happening more frequently. And so, you know, the, the, the number of days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit has been increasing in the United States for quite some time and will continue to. Yeah, and what, what we found with a study here at JPL is that um, frequencies is increasing. So we're getting six to eight a year in Southern California and the duration is increasing as well. So they're, they're lasting now, you know, upwards to of six to seven days where if the definition was classified as three days or more. Um, but then another more interesting fact we found was that it's not the daytime severity or the, the maximum temperatures that are increasing of the heat wave, but it's more the nighttime. So it's the nighttime heat waves that are becoming much warmer and much more humid uh, relative to the daytime. And that's, of course, causing a lot of issues with, with the human health issues. People can't sleep at night and that transform, translates into the next more stress the next day. And so you have this cumulative effect of, of detrimental health impacts and and indeed that was one of the issues with the pacific northwest heat wave is it was so hot during the day that it didn't really cool off much at night mm -hmm. and then, then then of course the next day you know it was hot again you know and so you know it's it's a cumulative kind of a effect yeah people can't recover exactly yeah so we've started to get a bunch of questions toward the end, and um, we're not going to have time to address them all, unfortunately. So I would like to pose one last question to all of you that might tie together a lot of what the the 
audience is asking, and what's one recommendation that you would make to policy makers who are interested in addressing extreme heat? Start with Michael since your mic is on. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I think the policymakers have to understand that dangerous climate change is here and now. It's not just heat waves, of course. Um, all sorts of other types of extreme weather are changing because of climate change. And that the public knows this. I mean, this is, this is, you know, this is not a political issue. This is a human health issue. And, and we need to address it. We need to address it now. And it's not our children's problem. It's not our grandchildren's problem. It's our problem. And, and that's what I would like policymakers and our elected officials to, 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 um, to really, really embrace, which, you know, starting that happened, but you know, it always seems like it's two steps forward and one step back. And so we can't take those backward steps any longer. Thank you. I'll go next to Sumanji. Yeah, I agree with what Michael said. Uh, so I would say that I would like to see that the things which are already there in the market be incentivized and, you know, so that they reach the deserving community that, okay, here. Um, so, in you know, educate communities, give in incentive to take whatever already, already available in the market uh, there, and then also put some funding into this low uh, DRL research work because you know we have low e windows today because somebody invested and thought about how uh, that we need that right so if you're if you want a next generation cooling solution so the research needs to be done now and they so I would say that in like this adaptive materials which can work both in cool and heat so that kind of research needs to be uh, funded and more um, encouraged so I think that that are my two cents there. Thanks. Thank you. Wayne, go ahead. Um, I'd say that there's, you know, there's short-term and long-term solutions that um, decision makers and policy makers can focus on in the short term to issue better and more um, uh, data-driven heat warnings uh, in the cities themselves, and then also um, setting up uh, better and more efficient cooling centers in, in the poorer communities that you know, people can go and get relief from from the hot uh, weather. Um, and then more long-term, I think the best long-term solution is, is just planting more, more trees in, in these regions, um, you know, cooling the air and cooling, cooling the ground at the same time. Um, and then, of course, the smart surfaces, you know, LA City is currently in a two-year project, uh, four, four million dollar project where they're, they're implementing these cool roads over six different districts in LA right now. That's a no-brainer, I think. Um, um, and then again, to also increase and subsidize um, the, the implement, implementation of solar roofs in these areas as well, I think is, is really important. Um, so yeah, I think that that's about it. So much. I, I, I want to thank everybody who joined us today, and uh, thank you to AAAS for organizing the conference, and of course to our wonderful panelists. Just really appreciate all of your thinking and um, answering of the audience questions. Again, sorry we weren't able to get to all of the questions. There were some really great thoughts out there. Um, if you'd like to learn more about extreme heat, please be sure to check out our videos. And if you would like to learn more about CCST, please visit our website at ccst.us. And also please make sure to visit the CCST booth in the virtual expo hall to learn more about our science policy fellowship program. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.